during that the following week, I got the letter saying you've got a, a place. Now, having got the place, they probably thought that's the end of that campaign, but it wasn't because we then continued. And I remember making representations to the uh, Dame Jocelyn Barrow inquiry about the monopoly run by the Inns of Court School of Law. Uh, they were the only bar school at the time and they chose what they did and they, you know, it, it, before they were taken over by the city university. So we started that campaign to break that monopoly. Um, even if there were 500 uh, pupillage places, uh, let the markets determine who gets in and who doesn't get in, but do not cause a restriction at the door. Because sometimes people train to be barristers and never practice as barristers, but they take those skills elsewhere. So people should still have the right to train as barristers, even if they don't practice as barristers. So we started again uh, another campaign. Eventually, that monopoly was broken. And of course, the institution which um, we later worked for, um, the BPPs and so on and so forth, came to life and other places. And so that's how that, that's the, the story behind how the monopoly of the Inns of Court School of Law was broken. I like to say I was played a small part, you know, a very, very small part in, in doing that. I know I've had a conversation with some barristers recently who have said, but well, that was the wrong thing because what's happened now is that um, we're producing so many barristers we're producing so many barristers who yes. are spending thousands and thousands of pounds to be yes. trained with barristers yes. and a substantial majority will not be able to get pupillage yes and, or even if they are able to secure pupillage they're not going to be able to get tenancy absolutely um, for me um i should have the right if i want to with my eyes open knowing fully well that there are not many places in the profession, and it happens in other professions as well. Uh, we train very few doctors and then for the NHS, but they then have to go abroad to find more doctors. The accounting profession also does exams which restrict some numbers and so on and so forth. But I should have the right to take those exams. That should be my right, um, even if the work is, may or may not be there. I want to be part of this profession. I shouldn't be pre prevented by very artificial obstacles which were being put forward. I know on the other hand, we there's always, whenever there are restrictions, it disproportionately affects black people and other minorities. Um, but those are separate arguments which we have to take at each stage, why we should all have a right to be treated equally. And that's all we ask for. We're not saying lower the standards. Do not lower the standards. Let's keep the standards as they are. It's a very difficult profession to get into. It's a very difficult profession to survive in. Mm. Don't lower the standards, but give us an equal chance. That's all we ask for. So that's well, the, the, the major obstacle, talking about obstacles, which is where well, we started. Well, let's move on then from the obstacles. Yeah. And let's talk about the present day. Now you yes. are practicing, as I said, in criminal law, as well as yes. alternative dispute resolu resolution. And you yes. are an expert determinator. Determinator? Yes. Is that how you say it? Determiner. Yes. Determiner. I like the determinator part. I like the determinator. Actually, determiner. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. So expert determiner. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can see I'm completely <laughs> naive to, to what that actually is. So what is an expert yeah. determiner? A, an ext expert determiner is actually older than a lot of the other alternative dispute resolution strategies or practices. However, it's not very popular. Um, and I think it should be more popular. It's cheaper, it's confidential. So all ADR is confidential. But with expert determination, it's even cheaper because every dispute can be narrowed down to a number of questions or even just one question. And that's what the expert determines. For example, if two people are fighting 
uh, in dispute over a ten thousand pounds. And a, yeah. Yes, yeah. ten thousand or a war, for example. Yeah. Um, and you go to an expert determiner. What you would then have to do between the parties is to narrow the question, the the, the dispute down to a question. It could be as simple as in whose property is the war? Is it a party war, for example? So you would go through, if you're, you could be asked, there are two sides to it. You could be asked to give reason for your decision, for your answer to the question, or you may be asked to just answer the question, no reasons. So whose wall it is, it belongs to Sonia, end of. Both parties will sign a contract that that is binding on the parties. It's enforceable, is it? Did you say it's binding? It's binding on both parties. So you can't challenge it in court because it's a contract. Yeah. Unless uh, I or anybody acting as an, as, a, as an expert does anything wrong, that's the only basis. Let's say I was talking to the other side and not talking to, um, not telling the other side what I was discussed with party A, for example, and I've not told okay. B. But okay. other than that, it's straightforward, it's a contract, and that works in a lot of these big companies who do not want their images uh, to be um, dragged in, in the mud in public. So they will have a dispute, you answer the question, and people move on. And it's cheap, straight to the point, and, and that's it. So that's, that's uh, it's, it's one of those which, when people come to it and they see how straightforward, there's no pleadings as you see because I, even arbitration now is becoming more like a huge substantial civil case because lawyers have now got involved and the procedures have become so cumbersome because lawyers have become involved the pleadings are lengthy and you start exchanging information further and better particulars and all those things which made civil or commercial litigation expensive and cumbersome are beginning to show in up in in the arbitration but with uh, expert determination it's a simple straightforward of course you can make representations you can make representations but you don't need to provide pleadings you know uh, the expert will ask questions if i have a question for either side that question would go out to everybody at yeah. once. So for me to answer the question that you want me to answer, I'm asking you to the, these sets of questions. Yeah. So okay. whoever can answer that one will say, yes, I can answer this one. The other person says, yes, I can do this one. I can't do that one. And that will bring me to the position where I can now answer the final question, which is the fundamental question to the dispute. So it's about identifying what the question is that will resolve that dispute. And most of the time, it does resolve a dispute. Your practice takes you from England and Wales to Nigeria. So you actually practice in it Nigeria does. as well as England and Wales. Are you practicing criminal law in Nigeria? In Nigeria, the specialization that, the, that we have in the UK it's, it's a new phenomenon where people are now becoming more specialized in certain things. But I find that when I've had a criminal case, it is related to a commercial dispute, if that makes sense. So, yeah. for example, um, somebody has a commercial dispute, just to speak in general terms, in the United Kingdom, for example, and it may be a contract issue. But over there in Nigeria, where the matter started from, um, you find in Nigeria, they use the police to resolve contract disputes sometimes. And yes, yeah, so if you're owing me a, a billion pounds, maybe the contract failed. A simple case can take about 10 to 15 years to resolve. So if I have a dispute with you, a financial dispute, it could take in the court system, it could, it could be there for about 15 years going back and forth mm. in Nigeria. So what then happens is people try to circumvent 
that long, lengthy process by arresting their opponent, getting the police or the, uh, you know, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC, which is the dreaded organization that arrests people sometimes for what is essentially a contract dispute. So those kind of cases, when I'm involved in criminal cases in Nigeria, it will be those kind of cases mm -hmm. which ordinarily are contract disputes, but the other side has chosen to use the criminal law to say, yes, you defrauded me. Um, I'm really interested to know, when you are representing clients in Nigeria, do you have to adapt your advocacy style um, to, to the Nigerian? Yes, if, I think... If I can put it that way. In my own case, I haven't had to. And I know some people have to, depending on your... Um, you know, we started off talking about my personality. My personality is who I am. So I can address a court in the United Kingdom as, as the same way as I will address in Nigeria. Some people find that, uh, some people struggle in the sense that people will claim they don't understand your accent. You're speaking Queen's English. Speak properly. We don't understand what you are saying. So sometimes it's to, to ridicule you, to say, you know, speak properly, you're speaking Queen's English, you know, those kind of yeah. things which your opponents would adopt just to bring you down a peg yeah. if they think you're speaking um, in a very refined way. You know, some, some people have, you know, the, the posh English accent, which doesn't work well in the Nigerian courts. And one of the other things that happened to me regularly in Nigeria, when you're in front of a female judge, it's my lord. Mm. And if I've come back from Nigeria and I've well, appeared today. in a Nigerian court yeah. and it's my lord to a female, I've come to the high court in, in England or in the court of appeal. And I've referred, instead of saying my lady, I've said my lord, because I've just come off the flight and I'm not sure which jurisdiction I'm in. <laughs> and you can see the frown on people's faces, like, oh, it's, it's my lady, it's my lady. So I'll say my lady. In Nigeria, you cannot refer to a, a female judge as my lady. It's got to be my lord. Oh, right. So the, the female yes. puppies are stri stripped of their femininity, are they? They, they don't see it that way, mm -hmm. um, but that's what I think. You've talked so, about slight differences in terms yes. of perhaps customs and style. Um, yes. So can we talk about differences um, between the clients? So your yes. lay clients in yes. the UK and yes. your lay clients in, the, in Nigeria. Yes. I want you to talk about how you interact with them. Is there a difference? There is a stark difference. And... In, in the UK, uh, as you remember, when we started off, um, we, I represented quite a lot of white working class um, people. And they were very, very happy to see us. They believed that you understand their plight and you will fight for them. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons in the why- main. Very, In the main, yeah, very early, early on, we were very busy. And the, the problem I found was that it was the Nigerian clients, for example, that didn't want a Nigerian background representing them because they say, well, you, we face racism, you're going to be facing racism. So we want a white person to represent us. Yes. So our brothers and sisters from the Caribbean will say, yes, I would love you because I think you understand the system and you'll fight for me but the Nigerian clients didn't want us initially. But as time went on, the Nigerian clients in the UK started to realize that you can actually have a Nigerian represent you and successfully. They realized it didn't matter. Now, the clients in Nigeria, um, as in on the Nigerian soil, expects you to be 